we're all excited to be here today prior to, uh, to honor these uh, mound builders who have demonstrated their craft through determination and talent. Those we honor today dedicated themselves to, creation, to creating and appreciating beauty and to teaching, performing, and supporting. Indeed, we are fortunate at Southwestern to have a proud tradition of fine arts and graduates who go into the world and share the beauty. So again, thank you for being with us today and congratulations to our well-deserving inductees and their families at this time. It is my pleasure to invite Dr. Shook to come and introduce them. Thank you. Hello, I am Timothy Shook and I serve as the chair for the Department of Music. It is my privilege to be here today as we recognize exemplary graduates who make us all feel pr very proud to be builders. We hope you have had an opportunity to view the Physical Fine Arts Hall of Fame display in Darbeth Lobby across the parking lot. Uh, there you will see an outstanding group of inductees to which today's group will be added. A plaque to recognize that this hall was underwritten by the Jenkins Endowment funded by Mr. Charles Kopke, Southwestern College Class of 1944. This recognition is to honor 20 plus years of fundraising service to Southwestern College by Mr. Ronnie Jenkins. The Southwestern College Fine Arts Hall of Fame was established in 2009 to lift up alumni and friends who have significant achievements in the arts. With this hall, we give recognition and honor to those whose creative abilities and dedication has allowed them to bring unparalleled beauty, grace, and entertainment to the world. For that, we recognize these worthy individuals for their efforts. On behalf of the Southwestern College, it is my privilege to pre present this honor. I would like to call your attention to the beautiful glass awards that you see right here. Uh, these handmade awards are given annually to Fine Arts Hall of Fame inductees. They are handcrafted by Mr. Scott Hartley, who fittingly is not only a graduate of Southwestern, but also a member of this Hall of Fame. Scott has for several years been the artist who creates the Hall of Fame awards. As a Southwestern science major, Scott went on to use his artistic talents and his knowledge of science to become a master glass blower. We are fortunate to be able to give these unique gifts to our inductees to permanently remind them of their honored place in our hall. Our first inductee this morning is Misty Maynard, class of 1975. Misty was born and raised in Winfield and received her undergraduate degree from Southwestern College. She, learned, uh, she later earned a Master of Arts degree in theater from the University of Kansas. She worked out of the Bolus Fine Arts Center in Iola, acting as a communications link between art councils in nine counties the Kansas Art Commission in Topeka, and professional artists and touring companies as the program coordinator for the Southeast District of Community Arts Councils of Kansas. Misty was the executive director of the Pittsburgh Area Arts and Crafts Association, where she advised and aided the board of directors on administrative matters, organizational structure, and on selecting, implementing, and evaluating programs and projects. She was an artist in residence through the Kansas Arts Commission in Topeka before she began teaching as an adjunct instructor on the college level and now has over 35 years of college teaching experience. Misty owns and operates the Kichai Playhouse a little theater housed in what was a Methodist church in Kichai. The business has been operating for 38 years. The 100-year-old building underwent a major rehabilitation in 2019 thanks to a federal community development block grant. She has written eight full-length plays and is a Kansas Writers Project Fellow. Yeah, 
Oh, I didn't know we were going to get something so pretty. That's just delightful. It is so nice to be here with friends and fellow alumni and, and people from my hometown and colleagues. It's just very, very exciting. Um, I had, just like all celebrities, a driver today. Uh, Greg Dalton White, I think, actually nominated me. And he and his husband, John, are here today with me, which makes it extra special. I've never seen Richardson uh, in its renovated stage. It's just gorgeous. I think it's just beautiful. Um, I fell in love with this school when I started throwing the early morning paper, and I just knew this was where I needed to be. And I always hoped that maybe I could teach for Southwestern, and I am now teaching an online class, which is a highlight of my teaching career, um, teaching art appreciation, and it's just really special. The building um, that was mentioned was in distress. Uh, bricks had actually fallen down out of the wall, on the outer wall, and uh, they don't list waiting for your building to be condemned as a reason for depression, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> and the city said, no, we're not going to let this happen. The city of Kichai, which is just, just 10 minutes outside of Wichita, I hope you'll all come up this summer. And um, they found this grant, and it now is stronger than it was when it was built. That's what I've been told. And the outside is just beautiful. It's just very, very small theater. And this will be our 40th year in business. So uh, we're very excited about that. And I'd be glad to see any of you at any time. And thank you so very, very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Now, uh, uh, we will uh, be uh, giving the award to Mari Wall Robinstein, class of 1960. Mari is accepting an award presented to the Wall Robinsteins, Mari and Tom. Though our friend Tom is no longer with us physically, we celebrate his ongoing presence at Southwestern and in our community, and we recognize both Mari and Tom today. Tom, graduate of 1959, and Mari Waite, graduate of 1960, Wall Robinstein, met at Southwestern College and remained faithful supports of Southwestern College since their graduation. They moved to California, where Tom graduated from Claremont School of Theology but returned to Winfield when President C. Orville Stroll made Tom the first paid alumni director of Southwestern College. Working throughout the nation, Tom recruited students, interviewed prospective faculty, and encouraged financial support among alumni. The Wall Robinsteins left Southwestern in 1965 to pastor churches in California, Hawaii, and Arizona. In 1975, they returned to Winfield, this time with Tom serving as a development officer at Southwestern College. This meant a homecoming for Mari. Her parents, former trustees Byron and Helen Waite, still lived in town, and Mari became an adjunct faculty member at Southwestern College. Another stint in local ministry, serving local churches in Kansas between 1979 and 1990, came to a close when the couple retired back to Winfield. Even then, Tom worked part-time on the development staff in a role designed to exploit Tom's pastoral skills. Through the years of serving the college, both as administrators and as volunteers, Tom and Mari have financially supported its goals. From their first major gift, which named the Art Studio in Darbeth, to their support of the Great Performances Campaign, they have underscored their love for Southwestern with sacrificial giving. Mari has continued her family's interests in educational endowments and scholarships, started by her parents. As a couple, Tom and Mari have included the college in their estate plan and support the annual fund, as well as special projects. In 
It is an honor and privilege for us to be a part of the Fine Arts Hall of Fame today. Forgive me for using the plural pronouns we and us, for as you now know, my late husband Tom is not with us in body, but I can assure you he's here in spirit. For this honor is as much his as mine. Our support of the college through the years has always been a partnership of 110%. For many months now, I have been reflecting on how two people named Tom and Mari have arrived to this place in this time. For neither of us have ever been in a play Neither of us have ever played in an orchestra or sang in a choir. I have created objects of art and I collect art, but only for display in my home. So if we haven't participated directly or personally in the fine arts, where does that leave us? I have mused about this dilemma, dilemma with Roger Moon on many occasions, and hopefully I'm not putting words in his mouth, but he always reminded us gently and wisely of how important an audience is to the performance, performers. It doesn't matter whether you're musicians or actors or artists or circus acrobats. You need, they need an audience. It's best when it's a supportive, enthusiastic <laughs> audience, but nevertheless, they need an audience. That is feedback to them that not only gives them motivation, but validation. You may see where I'm going with this. Yes, this is exactly where Tom and I fit into the fine arts scenario. Being supportive in any way possible. Now, this is not a philosophy or a persona that just dropped down of the sky one day when we were adults. It was um, it was a process. It was a growing, developing process starting in our youth. It isn't a matter of, well, it's also, it's, it's creating opportunities to expand that experience, but it's also taking advantage of those opportunities when they present itself. My husband used to love to tell the story of when he was in later high school years and early college that during the summer he and his best friend would drive down to the Old Globe Theater in San Diego to enjoy performances of Shakespeare's comedies. This is taking advantage of an opportunity that was present in his world. Although, in my mind, the choice of entertainment was a little unusual for someone his age. <laughs> Likewise, in my youth, I must have been about 13, my parents arranged for me to have art lessons. Now, these weren't the usual art lessons of sketching and drawing and painting still lifes. Oh, no. Every Saturday morning for a year, <clears throat> I went to the teacher's home and studio. And in, during the morning, with her guidance, I was to create an art piece out of whatever medium she chose. And this could was everything from pebbles or sand from the nearby river to finger paint 
to twigs or leaves from the trees around her house, to beads, to lace, to fabric, you name it, we worked with it. What a tremendous foundation that laid for me. It unbounded my own creative processes, began to make me sensitive to light and shadow, texture, color, and most of all, it made me aware of the beauty of God's creation. Such experience con experiences continued for us into college years, particularly for me, here at Southwestern. Both the experiences I'm going to share with you took place in this very building. In those days, and it wasn't quite the dark days, but it was back in 1959 and 60. Um, the college could contract, or maybe there was an entity that contacted the college. I'm not sure which way it went. But they could contact to be up and coming, to bring up and coming um, artists to the campus to give concerts. I still remember the feelings I had after attending a performance in this very auditorium of an up-and-coming opera star by the name of Leotine Price. And Frida knows who I'm talking about. It, it was awesome. It left a marvelous impression on me. Now the other experience I share with you is at the other end of the spectrum. I spent many hours on the third floor of this building at the north end where the art department and the art studio was located. It was a one-man department and that person, professor, was Dennis Aiken who's already been inducted into the Fine Arts Hall of Fame. And he was kind enough to mention my name in his remarks. I took every class that was offered in that discipline. In fact, Dennis Aiken and I created a couple of independent studies so I would have a knowledge and acquaintanceship with art history. That's how I ended up having a minor in art when I graduated from Southwestern. But now I want to share a really valuable lesson out of that experience. The art department never had enough money for supplies. And so Dennis Aiken, I worked a lot in big mosaic projects. Dennis Aiken went out and found on some place on this hill a vein of clay and he would dig a bucket full, come in, we would add water to it, take off our shoes and socks and roll up our pant legs and squish, 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 squish. We would mix the water with the clay and send it through the sieve several times. That's how we got, not the greatest quality, but it was workable for the mosaics. Now there's a lesson that is really valuable for life. <laughs> I attained my very first job after I graduated, and Tom and I were married, not because of my major, but because of the liberal arts education I had received here at Southwestern. It was because I knew the difference between Mozart and Rachmaninoff and Picasso and Rembrandt. When we were first married and living in California when Tom was in the School of Theology, uh, one year, I think it was, I don't know whether it was Christmas or an anniversary, we decided to give each other tickets to an aspect of the fine arts that we were not acquainted with. 
He gave me tickets to an opera, and I gave him tickets to a ballet. We have enjoyed, we enjoyed many performances of those fin venues throughout our life's journey. That was an opportunity created by us. These types of experiences continued for us throughout our life's journey. I will say that four years in Hawaii allowed us to become acquainted with five different cultures. Talk about an enriching experience. All of this began to come together as we approached our retirement years. We returned to Winfield and to the college. We both continued part-time employment, but during these years, we made a very conscious decision to travel, to travel as much as time and money would allow us. And boy, did we travel. Uh, it included everything from May terms, college students and faculty going to New York, Israel, England. It included many host elder hostels to the largest metropolitan cities of our nation, like New Orleans and Chicago, San Francisco. It even included a bus trip from Missouri to Oregon following the Lewis and Clark Trail. And it included many, many river cruises throughout Europe Eastern Europe, and Asia. Every, once we learned how to get around New York, Tom and I went often on our own, um, not only to be saturated with music theater, but we made a conscious decision every time we went to choose a new and different museum to visit. This was taking advantage of opportunities presented to us. All of this only increased our enjoyment and appreciation of the fine arts. We were fortunate enough in these retirement years to expand our participation and enjoyment from the audience to other things to sponsor concerts of the symphony, to sponsor summer plays, to create scholarships, and name a building. <laughs> that, the high point was really the dedication of the Tomari Center. And I'm going to close with one little story about the naming of that building. It doesn't take too much for you to see where it came from, but there's a story behind that. I can see the late afternoon meeting when Dr. Merriman and Tom and I were sitting around our dining room table. We had concluded the necessary business for our support gift for the naming and we're talking about the other things as well as the name. And in my forthright manner, I turned to him and I said, Dr. Merriman, there is no way we are putting Wal Robinstein on that building. I said, I love my married name. And it's been a conversation piece for 60 years, but it is too long, <laughs> too difficult. That building will either end up with no name or a nickname. I said, I've got an idea. Let me play around with it for a little bit. For you see, Tom and I were around when the wonderful performance art center just to the north of Richardson was being built. The couple, Mr. and Mrs. Wells, were from Oklahoma. He was on the board of trustees, and they were very good friends of the Strolls. And they gave the gift for the naming of that center. As you know, it's not called the Wells Center. 
they took the first part of his name and her given name was Elizabeth, but they called her Beth. His name was Darwin, and they took Dar and Beth and put them together. And that's how it got its name. I thought, aha, here's an idea. Um, I played around a little bit with Thomas, but that was too formal. Marianne is my given name, but nobody knows me by that. I've been Mari for 60 years. So I started putting those together and came up with Tomari. I thank the college and the fine arts department again for the honor they have bestowed upon us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mari. <clears throat> and now we recognize Frida Lindbergh, class of 1970. While at Southwestern College, Frida participated in choral activities, chapel, and instrumental music. But her future as an opera star was not assured when she did not make a cappella choir her freshman year. But by her senior year, with the help of her mentor, Dr. Warren Wooldridge, she overcame her propensity as a wallflower and stepped into solo work. She rounded out her senior year with induction into the school's music honorary, Mu Phi Epsilon, starred as Mary in Eagerheart, performed as soloist with the choir frequently, and including various oratorios performed by the choirs, and had the honor of being selected as one of 10 semifinalists for Wichita Symphony Orchestra's NAFSCAR Young Artist Auditions and Awards. Upon graduation, Frida taught junior high school music before discovering her real passion in performance. In 1971, Frida moved to Munich, Germany, to study with opera masters, including James King, Hans Hotter, and Heinz Imdahl. She also studied with Jernot Acting Studies and attended the Munich Music Academy. After her years of study, Frida began her prolific career as an opera performer. She was well known for her veracity and tenacity singing some of the most difficult, both in endurance and technique, roles in the repertoire. Frida has performed with the State Opera of Kiel, the Opera Houses of Trier, Augsburg, and Saarbrücken, the Offenbach Theater, the Winterthur, uh, which is a premier opera tour of France, and the Heidenheimer Festival, which was featured on German national television's Aspects of Culture. While performing in Germany, Frida was the guest of honor for Southwestern College's 100th anniversary, performing a solo recital and as so soprano soloist in a special performance of Haydn's creation. Frida began a teaching career in 1987 at the University of Kiel. In 1994, she returned to the United States and taught voice at Southwestern College, Bethany College, and gave master classes at Kansas State University while maintaining membership in the National Association of the Teachers of Singing, commonly known as NATS. Frida returned to Germany in 1998 and taught private lessons until her retirement in 2005. She enjoys a post-retirement career as a dog trainer. Well, Mari is a tough act to follow. And uh, I had Mr. Charles Johnston help me with this uh, what did you call it? Response. Response. But um, Dr. Shook told a lot of it. But I will uh, embellish some of that. <laughs> um, as I say, 
I talk and I sing, but I don't write. <laughs> um, throughout my time as an undergraduate, Dr. Wildrich would challenge me to be the best I could be. Uh, my first year, I was placed in the chapel choir. My second year, after my audition, he went back to his desk, sat there like this, looked up to me, and said, so you think you can sing, can you? And I pointed at him and said, yes, sir, and went out that door. <laughs> it <ins> <laughs> The wallflower had bloomed, <laughs> and he knew how to get it out of me. It inspired me to be the very best and rise to every occasion. He would lead us on adventures, inquire tours, and became a cherished postgraduate friend, helping me with my early professional trials and tribulations as a music educator. Often, when I returned to the States, he, his wife Harriet, and I would spend a week together talking about my professional accomplishments, challenges, and the good old days. And as Dr. Shook um, said, I was invited um, to the, be the guest of honor at the 100th anniversary celebration of Southwestern in 1985. While here is something a little different, while at Southwestern, I was also privileged to have the sort of exposure that makes you a better person. Uh, from helping one of my roommates through a mental health crisis to teaching tennis, I uh, have tennis trophies at home. I was a mean tennis player. <laughs> health crisis to teaching tennis. Uh, Miss Cloud was the teacher then. My mother had her in 1936 when she was here. <laughs> so I asked her if I could teach tennis because I knew all the rest of that stuff. So I did that and then um, Smith Hall had a little balcony thing. So it was always a thrill to dodge the hedge apples thrown at us while we were sunbathing up there. That was <laughs> always kind of funny. Uh, as Dr. Shook said about tenacity, I developed here on campus and uh, it allowed me to thrive as an opera career in Europe. Whenever I came upon a challenge, Dr. Woldridge's training allowed me to rise to the occasion. One incident I will always remember was when I got a call from an agent in Vienna, Austria, asking me to sing one of the feared roles, Abigail, in the opera Nabucco. Um, I had only sung it in German many times, so um, he took a chance. So I practiced and listened and worked hard so that by the end of the performances, my fellow singers, most were Italian, thought I'd sung this all my life in Italian. <laughs> um, it was wonderful, oh my gosh. Um, so then, I was also called to substitute for an ill performer on a 24 hours notice for a concert version of the Magic Flute. I learned and committed also to memory a duet and two arias, including one that included the holy grail of the opera performance, the high C, which I was known for here in choir. We sang a Negro spiritual and uh, Jim Graves and I hummed five high C's. And uh, if anybody wants to hear it, we made a record and uh, they have a CD somewhere. Um, so anyway, um, coming back and serving on the faculty in 1994, 
was one of the joys of my life because I was able to share all of these experiences with the next generation of musicians here at Southwestern. Charles McKenzie, a private student of mine, was touched enough by my time that he nominated me for this great honor. The only thing one can hope for in life is to make an impact on your part of the world, as Mari had pointed out. And I'd like to think my induction into the Hall of Fame pays tribute to my time trying to do just that. I graciously join the ranks of the Southwestern College alumni who have touched the world of the performing arts in their own unique way. Thank you very much. Again, thank you for joining us today and celebrating the 2022 inductees to the Fine Arts Hall of Fame. It has been our privilege and joy to host you this morning. Again, our sincere gratitude for your support of Southwestern College and the arts.